They were still there, still staring. Twelve of them if he counted the baby in its mother's arms. He was good and drunk now. When his stomach couldn't hold any more, he would let Tom the barman show him to the door. And the twelve would follow Fagin through the streets of Belfast, into his house, up the stairs and into his bedroom. If he was lucky and drunk enough, he might pass out before their screaming got too loud to bear. That was the only time they made a sound, when he was alone and on the edge of sleep. When the baby started crying, that was the worst of it. Fagin raised the empty glass to get Tom's attention. Haven't you had enough, Jerry? Tom asked. Is it not home time yet? Everyone's gone. One more, Fagin said, trying not to slur. He knew Tom would not refuse. Fagin was still a respected man in West Belfast, despite the drink. Sure enough, Tom sighed and raised a glass to the optic. He brought the whiskey over and kind of changed from the stained tabletop. The gummy film of old beer and grime sucked at his shoes as he walked away. Fagin held the glass up and made a toast to his twelve companions. One of the five soldiers among them smiled and nodded in return. The rest just stared. Fuck you, Fagin said. Fuck the lot of you. There you go. Thank you. Okay, so Stuart, really good to have you here. Um, just here with, uh, with Stuart, Stuart Neville, who's a, uh, uh, a crime writer from, uh, from Belfast in Northern Ireland. Um, and uh, we're just here today in Montpellier just to, uh, to talk about your, your books and uh, some of the background surrounding them. Okay. Um, just want to uh, do a little cheers to, uh, to Montpellier and to the uh, comedy delete. So, um, one of your, your, your first book, um, The Twelve, begins with, uh, with your main character, Jerry Fagan, uh, doing a cheers to, uh, to 12 of his ghosts who, uh, who have been haunting him. Well, the story actually started as a as a short. Uh-huh. It, uh, this sounds a bit corny, but I, I, I woke up on a Sunday morning with this image in my head, and it's like a sort of still image of a man sitting in a bar, getting drunk, surrounded by all the people that he killed. So I, I, I woke up with this picture in my head, and I had my mobile phone by the bed, and it had a Word application, a little uh, word processor. So I started writing a short story on my phone, and. Um, finished it later that day and it, it kind of stuck with me for about a month or so. Um, I kept nagging me that there was more to this story. It was essentially the first chapter of the book. Um, and it was about a month later I finally said, no, I have to sit down and turn this into a novel. And um, I had been very resistant to the idea of writing about Northern Ireland, uh, specifically The Troubles. Um, I'd written two novels previously that would never ever be published. Um, one was set in America, one was set in England. I just did not want to write about Northern Ireland. But when this short story came along, it, uh, it, it I couldn't help the story. We just belonged there, and, okay. and these ghosts. So, okay. so this no, this was the first first of your books to get published. Mm-hmm. You tried writing other stories set set outside of Ireland. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been trying to write since I was a kid, and I uh, attempted over the years. Maybe yeah. I managed a chapter or a few paragraphs or something. Um, but it wasn't until about five, six years ago where I thought, no, if I'm going to do this, I have to take it seriously and really give it a go. Um, so I wrote two novels very, very quickly, one after the other. Um, and I said they weren't good at all, they, they weren't good. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I set something set in, in my, my own country that I, yeah. that I finally got something that worked. So I, I couldn't avoid it. So that's quite a kind of... Would you say that's quite an established idea? That, uh, the idea that, that Northern Ireland has got a has got a history which uh, is almost haunting the present. Well, yeah, I mean, Nor- Northern Ireland and Ireland in general is defined by its past. I mean, when, when I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a cliche. I mean, people um, when people want to explain some of the characteristics of, of, of modern Ireland, it's almost always the 800 years of oppression gets sort of thrown up as a very convenient label uh, or an explanation for everything that stands today and it's um, very, I think very often to, to its detriment, the, the, the history just lingers there all the time, it's always in the past, it's always referenced yeah. and like a kind of a ghost it does haunt. Yeah. Present. In this in this book alone, you have to um, you have to think of twelve different ways of uh, characters to die. <laughs> uh-huh. um, is that challenging? 
picking up uh, It takes a bit of imagination, but uh, uh, I, that comes about because I, writers you'll find will tend to write about the thing that scare them. Yeah. And I have a terrible, terrible fear of injury. The idea of cutting my finger makes me shudder. I, I, I hate it. So I, I kind of exercise that when I write by writing with horrendous mutilations and tortures and injuries and so on, just because it scares the life out of me. So it's um, a way of uh, a little bit of self therapy, I think. I suppose, you know, the, one, of the, you know one of the main reasons is that the 12th, the first book has been, has been translated, and then the second one is on the way. Yeah. I understand the third plans to translate that as well. Uh -huh. um, I was pretty, um, pretty amazed at how many languages your novels have already been translated into, um, including Iceland. Icelandic, yeah, and Japanese are kind of the two of the surprising ones. Um, I'm, I'm very lucky to have a, a really good literary agent who is particularly strong with translation rights. Okay. Um, so the book is sold in uh, Germany and Spain and Sweden and Poland. Uh, I can't, I can't even count. Certainly in France um, and to slightly lesser extent Germany, people are much more interested in the political side of the books. Um, in America and in, and in Britain, people are just reading the most as thrillers. Um, Amer the American audience, I think they view them more as a literary kind of thriller, whereas in the UK they consider more commercial thrillers. Uh, but very much so in, in France and Germany, I find so people much more interested in the uh, background to the books. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, they're much more interested in the history yeah, that yeah. goes into them. Yeah. And one you know, of the problems that I find in the UK is that we read books uh, um, where we're not keen enough to look at in, into the real world, the real the political um, significance, uh, social significance mm -hmm. of books. Um, we too often just read them as works of art. Yeah. Detached from the world. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, for me, France is a, is a country with literary tradition with uh, gazelle, which is a word for when you're writing with an intention to uh, uh, politically change, significant, or at least revealing, uh, revealing the world around which we live in. I think maybe, yes, I think maybe it's part of the tradition. Yeah, I think, I think you're, you're right, there's maybe more of um, people wanting a context. Yeah. For the books, yeah. um, I mean, particularly in, in study literature, certainly at school in the UK and university, it is kind of it becomes too academic. I think that yeah. becomes yes. each book sort of exists in a bubble. Yeah. Um, you know, for all the studying of Shakespeare, I would have done at school. There was never any studying of the world that Shakespeare existed in, or, or, or Dickens, for that matter, any of the sort of the tentpole classic writers that one studies at, at school, um, there was never any examination of the history yeah. that came with all, yeah. all that, that uh, literature. Um, so maybe that's, maybe that's the difference here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, thank you very much. Okay, Sorry? I don't I don't think so.